Oh. Hit record. Yeah. Okay. Uh, well done, Angela. Well, in a publication, people don't highlight text they use. Okay. So, Alan, welcome to the Metaphorum webinar series. Thank you very much for accepting the English. Um, I was explaining to some of the people that arrived there earlier that um, we met Alan uh, in Louis Gardiner's um, dissertation. He, she was, hello, Roger. She was a, um, he, he was external examiner and uh, I read about his work the first time and I just found um, fascinating the perspective that Alan is going to explain to us about um, uh, about complexity and his inspiration in nature. And I think that um, for us in the Metaphorum community that we are all trying to follow and develop further Stafford Beer's ideas on complexity. Um, it's really inspiring to see such a completely new and, and uh, divergent way of looking at complexity and the inspiration that, that it processes, and especially all the with the traditional paradigms uh, of research, no? And uh, the doors that his research is opening that has followed in a very interesting way in her PhD. So welcome, and um, this, is, um, this is it. So please, um, you can share the screen now. And thank you, thank you, thank you very much. Let's hope I can can do that correctly. And uh, just we to, yeah, we want to go to that. A little introduction about yourself before we start. We want to go to slideshow. Start from first slide. Great, perfect. And it seems to be working at the moment. So, thank you very much, Angela, for uh, inviting me to present to you uh, my ideas about natural inclusion. And um, well, here we are. I'm going to put, present a PowerPoint presentation to you for a while uh, with hopefully some quite simple looking slides uh, and some you may find quite attractive, I hope. Um, so really, I'm going to be talking to you about natural inclusion or what we could think of as the receptive simplicity in the heart of complexity and to compassionate, regenerate and creative community life. So essentially, there's sort of an idea that underlying the complexities is indeed a simplicity. Many years ago, my scientist father recorded an obey when I was 15 months old, I said something in Polish that he translated as look at the light. But to me, reads more like see the zero in the light. It's very strange. But whatever that might or might not mean, the imagery of a zero point within a swirl of light has become very important to me and resides the core of my awareness of what I call natural inclusion. It features also in many of my paintings, not least the one I call holding openness. Think about that <sighs> phrase, holding openness. To me, it signifies, as I say, the receptive simplicity of, in the heart of complexity and the way out from the abstract rationality of conflict and opposition into a more compassionate, caring, and co-creative way of life. So here's that painting of mine, which I did in 2005, called Holding Openness. And we see illustrated here a receptive zero point within a circle of light. And uh, essentially that's right at the heart of the way I think. And it concerns what I call place time, as distinct from Einstein's space time or any of those more objectivistic perceptions. And you'll find that I also try to write poetry as a way to express uh, this understanding. When we acknowledge the receptive spatial hollowness of our interior and the responsive energetic surfacing of our exterior as the love in our life, the focal point of gravity within our dynamic situation. 
as our true self center in natural communion with all. So what is natural inclusion? Well, here's a fairly elaborate way of putting it, but it's a, a fairly comprehensive way of doing it. So inclusion is a mutually inclusive, co-creative, receptive, responsive relationship between intangible spatial stillness and energetic motion in the being, becoming, and evolutionary diversification of all material bodies, including our own. Philosophically, for long, long time, human beings have been caught between individualism and collectivism, of trying to understand how we operate in the world, either as individuals or as members of groups. And this is associated with two particular kinds of philosophy, which we can call dualism and monism, in which in either everything is separate or all is one. Some of you might recognize that originating in Aristotelian thinking. The thing about both dualism and monism is that in effect, self, or indeed group identity does not include natural neighborhood. And that's natural inclusion is different in the sense that everything is understood as dynamically distinct, but no thing exists as an isolated entity. So self and group identity dynamically includes and is dynamically included within a natural neighborhood. And there's a lovely quote from Wordsworth, which relates to that. In nature, everything is distinct, but nothing defined into absolute independent singleness. Wordsworth understood this. And I think that it's something about the poetic mind that understands this and can bridge between these, the sort of alternating uh, schism between dualistic and monistic ways of thinking. And it all has to do with a question of how we understand space and boundaries. In classical abstract logic, such as the logic of the excluded middle put forward by Aristotle, abstract space and material boundaries are regarded as mutually exclusive and so definitively isolate one thing from another. So we sort of get that kind of false dichotomy between the inner and the outer. Whereas in natural flow logic, natural space and material boundaries are understood to be mutually inclusive. is a continuous, receptive attractor, not a separator. Boundaries are responsive energetic distinctions, not isolators. You might have a feeling for how that relates exactly to what Wordsworth said. And he said so, I believe, in dispute with Erasmus Darwin. <laughs> but that's another question. I can't remember whether I got that right or not. And this takes us to these two different modes of perception that we tend to have as human beings. We tend to argue about the, the relative merits of objective perception, which is much adored by scientists or those who call themselves scientists, and subjective perception, which is more of an artist or tends to be more of an artistic way of looking at things. But there are problems. Objective perception, as those who are aware of quantum mechanics and the findings of quantum mechanics recognize, has the effect of instantaneously isolating the observer from the observed. This painting here is one called Arid Confrontation, one I made 
after one year of, of postgraduate research and I was very depressed because the nature that I was wanting to understand was somehow being locked off to me, lock, locked off from me by the very scientific method that I was trying to employ in terms of objective perception. And so I represented that feeling that something was getting in the way of my deeper understanding. And it was something to do with definitive thought. And indeed, I recognize these days that that objectivistic perception has damage or leads to damaging mis misconceptions of which one of the most pernicious is this one. The idea of the origin of species by means of natural selection, not many people know that this is the subtitle, or the preservation of favored races in the struggle for life. Essentially, the misconception of isolating self from other has the immediate effect of leading to that misconception. On the other hand, subjective perception includes the observer within the observed. And we often, often recognize the, the, the idea of subjective perception in the sense of we're all one, there are no boundaries, uh, there, is, there are no distinctions, it's, we're, it's, we're, we're all one. And indeed, that form of perception can lead to a, thought, to a sense of selflessness, selflessness of having, and, and this is a rather dramatic book title that I encountered, describing this and relating it to Zen. It, it described it as a, on having no head, but essentially that philosophy of being without self, of having no self, of ironically arising out of, out of subjective perception. But if we put the two together, we get comprehensive perception, which recognizes both the distinctions and the continuity at the same time. So it combines directional focus, that distance, that directional focus, which is a, all about objective viewing of what is outside above us in a, in a, in a frame of reference, with circumspection, that sense of being included in a panoramic uh, situation. I often sort of think about this a little bit in terms of if we had eyes on the sides of our head, <laughs> would we perceive the world in the same way as we do because we've got eyes on the front of our faces? The eyes on the front of our faces predispose to And the difficulty here is that when we try to split one partial view of reality from another, it causes ideological conflict. And right at the moment, we're witnessing yet again an example of ideological conflict arising from a, a false dichotomy, which essentially isolates self or group from what is perceived as enemy or other. And it has to do also with democracy. I, I still flinch every time I hear a politician talking about democracy, because as far as I'm aware, there are no political systems in the world at large currently that are truly democratic in the sense of involving governance for all, by all, through all. They're all based on majority rule, which is not democracy. That is isolating one segment of the population from another. Although the voting might be democratic, the representation certainly is not because it has the effect of splitting and asking a, uh, and asking a population to decide between one partial point of view and another partial point of view 
And this painting here is one called Honeysuckle Sharing Circle, which I painted, which, which essentially gives the idea of, of what I understand as true democracy, which is also the democracy of Aboriginal or indigenous sharing circles, essentially where, where, where we have, we would try to bring views together for, into coherence from all around, distinctive views from all around uh, through a virus center, which is openly receptive and responsive to those different views. So we see actually in this painting, the seven different so-called colors of the rainbow, red, orange, green, blue, indigo, whatever it is, and violet, plus black and white. But it essentially is, is recognizing a very different kind of relationship between an executive or a, 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 an executive and a population. And once upon a time, uh, when I was getting really fed up with Boris Johnson, I joined a demonstration <laughs> in which I presented this poster. Democracy is for all, not part. Now, there are three fundamental tenets of natural inclusion, as I understand it. And although you sort of find philosophically that there are that there are precedents for all three of these in various different philosophies and cultures. What I find rare is to find them all gathered together. The first tenet is that natural bodily boundaries are intrinsically dynamic, not fixed statically in place. So they're dynamically informed and sustained by continuous energy flow and disappear if the latter ceases. So our bodies are dynamically informed. And if, if the movements essentially from subatomic level outwards was stopped, we'd essentially disappear. Second tenet, natural void space, tangible, that means frictionless presence, that simultaneously invites energy flow both inwardly towards and around zero and outwardly towards infinity. Hence, all material bodies from subatomic to galactic are mutual inclusions of void space and energetic motion in receptive and responsive relationship. You might notice that I've made a move from Newtonian mechanistic action and reaction to a more fundamental relation, uh, relationship between receptive and responsive at an intangible uh, level. Well, so I've been trying to think about, I, I was sort of thinking about this in terms of the current interest that there is in regenerative sustainability or in regenerative economies and so forth. And it has to do with, it's trying to sort of recognize how, what an awareness of natural inclusion has to say in terms of natural processes, natural life cycle processes of degeneration and regeneration and of on the one hand boundary opening and proliferation and the other hand of, of boundary sealing and integration. So it's not either or, it's how these two relate together. And we see a relationship between, in, in all of life cycles, if we look at them carefully, in, uh, of, of, of natural life cycles of organisms, we see processes of regeneration and dissipative organization involving growth and reproduction, Switching over under, circum under circumstances of external shortage uh, to storage exploration to a more conservative or boundary sealing process. And ultimately also the vitality of death in life, the vitality of a degeneration in order to enable regeneration. If you try and stick in one or the other, you can't have one without the other. 
So, what does this mean mathematically? <laughs> well, I sort of was inspired some while ago by a Nigerian mathematician called Lere Shikunli, who, to my mind, made a very, very significant mathematical move in which he recognized that if we split zero from one and treat them in a binary way as either, either zero or one, as in computing, <clears throat> then essentially we've moved away from, how, from, from natural processes. But if we include the zero within one and we understand one as dynamically informed, not a static fixed object, then that is, a that is the move that we can make from abstract mathematics to natural mathematics. So it involves an integration of zero as a dynamic inclusion of one within infinity. The spatial stillness and energetic motion, soul and spirit in co-creative, mutually inclusive relationship, making us what we are, embodiments of place time. And I sort of sometimes like to think of this as, as a painting I made last year of confluence, of how this way of understanding the relationship between one as essentially a dynamic circulation around a receptive zero point center within infinite space can actually bring many disparate points of view into confluence and also relate to the ancient concept ideas of the elements of air, earth, fire, and water, and indeed the fifth element, which is recognized particularly in Hindu spirituality, space. <laughs> so here's a painting I made in December at the time of, of Louis Viva and conversation. Angela. Greetings from Middle Earth. So thinking of us as in the middle between heaven and hell or whatever. Life forms in the balance between flow and counterflow, into and out from the other, in response to innermost calling amidst infinite expanse. A love triangle in the making of heartfelt experience, at the seat of all knowing, in the wisdom of not knowing the natural inclusion of being and becoming, the in-breath in out-breath in common passion. And here, I, I tried this slide out on a scientist a little while ago and he got quite annoyed, but there we are. But I, point, I, I made this point. The signal failure of material science has always been to focus all attention on what can be seen, heard, touched, smelled, tasted, while disregarding what's immaterial as if it doesn't exist within, throughout, and all about us. As if space and time are material things in themselves, not their immaterial essences. But collective responsive relationship to make our world and ourselves as it is and we are, with darkness and light personified in flowing material form. We are participants in, not exceptions from the flow of life, as the flow of light, as the flow of time, which we receive and pass on excitedly with love, thanks and farewells, around and between our receptive centers in the dark stillness of space, within, between and surrounding our material bodies in myriad hues, shades and forms, inspiring and expiring in the heat of the moment. Ain't no such thing as space. Ain't no such thing as time. Space isn't material distance. Time isn't material duration. Distance is a manifestation of space. Duration is a manifestation of time. If we could only understand that, we'd be fine, knowing for once and for all that each and the other makes matter, not the other way around. That loving feeling, the feeling you have in the midst of your chest, which makes you want 
to embrace someone or something is what everything is ultimately made from. The immaterial within, throughout and all about the material. The silent, receptive stillness of omnipresent space. The rush of excitement, including each other in swirling form. The allness of me in radiant receptive awareness that sees both the tangible in the intangible and the intangible in the tangible, the motion in the stillness and the stillness in the motion goes so much wider and deeper than the wholeness of me, caught in momentary standstill, excluding what's been and what's yet to can't become, as if you and me are object and subject framed in definitive rigidity not beholden to each other in vibrant life. You can't have half a whole, but you can have half a whole. Therein resides the difference between being alive and dropping dead, natural inclusionality and abstract rationality. If you seek the murder weapon destroying life on earth, look no further than Occam's razor and the law of the excluded middle. I think I'll skip that one. I am space, so don't try to push me, because if you do, I'll just slip through you, as if there's no body there. I am here, there, and everywhere, within you, without you, and throughout you, always ready to take my place as the still, silent centre of your being in becoming, calling inwards from within, as I do also from without your dynamic envelope, which cannot resist me. And I'll still be here, no matter how much you move about, you'll never shake me off or shake me out. No matter what, I'll never leave you so long as you are here. And when and if you know this full well, you'll find me a comfort, not a curse. I wrote this today <laughs> because in, in relationship to th thinking about the problems that we're in as a result of believing in Darwinian selection. It seems I need to keep on saying this for the sake of generations to come and those of us now who know there's something terribly wrong with the way we've been led to believe that life's a struggle for existence. There is no barrier separating the space inside from the space outside, anybody. There is only a dynamic interfacing betwixt each and the other, holding the balance between the call from within and the call from without. So life evolves in response to receptive invitation to come into being, not as a reaction to mechanical action, as if it's a jack-in-a-box, all coiled up with nowhere to go until someone takes the lid off. So, Let's uh, stop sharing now and come back to you. <laughs> that may have been a bit uh, different. I don't know how you might feel about it, but there we are. Uh, that's that's where I've where I've got to, where I've become been coming from. Thank you very much, Alan. Really interesting. Um, I don't know how we do this. I guess that. Um, well, we should start um, questions for people. Um, I don't know if before we do that, would you like to share a little bit with people your background? Because I think that you have such an interesting Yes, <laughs> Yes, I mean, my background, <laughs> first, I, I was born in, in, in Nairobi, in, in Kenya in 1950. So I'm getting on a bit. <laughs> um, and I was there during the Mama Rebellion or the uprising. My mother was deputy mayor of Nairobi. It was a very trying and difficult time. And then my father had a sudden stroke in 1958. And within no time at all, we were back in London. So I experienced an extraordinary transition from living in sort of in a tropical uh, place and in, in, in somewhere where I actually absorbed some African philosophy, I'm very sure, and found myself trying to cope <laughs> with, 
with the English education system. And I struggled really badly at first until I started to understand the rules of the game. <laughs> and then I, once I'd understood the rules of the game, which were all to do with um, rationalistic logic, I found a way of getting, doing okay. And I did acad academically okay. I was fascinated in biology all the time. I, my father used to take me out on natural history walks and in particularly on fungal forays. And I was absolutely blown away to, to look by, by fungal, by the emergence of fungi, you know, almost so apparently mysteriously out of the ground or out of the trees. And I wanted to understand what was, what was, what that was all about. So I decided, well, I was persuaded pretty much to be, to study biology. And that meant being a scientist. <laughs> To study life, you have to be a scientist, apparently, or that's what I was told. And <laughs> I didn't realize quite what the implications of that were, because actually <laughs> I discovered that I really hated laboratories and I really hate libraries <laughs> and I hate being confined indoors. What inspires me is being outside in, make, in the natural world, appreciating uh, life you know without you know outside of a box of four walls and that was very significant i got anyway i managed to get to king's college cambridge i managed to get a, 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 a degree and a phd and for a while i uh, you know i became a, a lecturer then a reader at bath university studying fungi um that something was nagging at me all the while. And I also, you know, to be quite honest, I suffer, suffered tremendously and still do from anxiety, and in particular from OCD, or what is, di or, or what is diagnosed as that. And I, I just couldn't feel confident in, my, in, in, in either what I was doing or in, in, in myself. And I actually broke down back around, um, the turn of the millennium, around 1999, actually, after having just been president of the British Mycological Society, I broke down because I just couldn't go on any longer. Um, and within a couple of years from that, natural in I, I, I came to be a fully aware of natural inclusion as something that I'd always been aware of since childhood, since almost that's why I sort of talked about when I was 15 months old seeing the zero in the light <laughs> that's actually natural inclusion and that's a sort of awareness that I suspect all of us have as children only to have it beaten out of us by the academic by academic systems which essentially split the outer from the inner or conflate the outer and the inner so okay those are the two alternatives you either split them or conflate them whereas and I, I remember too that a very formative experience for me was my mother as a politician was a very extraordinary person and she used to hold a round uh, uh, soirees in our drawing room in which she invited all the different members of the community of the Kenyan community, Africans, Asians, whatever, you know, everybody together and arranged them in a circle to discuss the issues of the day and how they, people felt about them. She was friends with the first president of Kenya, Jomo Kenyatta, and that made her a target, strangely enough. So that's part of the fear. Um, and uh, but when I was actually sitting with her in one of those sharing circle sessions, I got this extraordinary feeling of, you know, I was looking out at all these very, very different faces. And there was I and I suddenly sort of got this feeling, as I think most children will do, is that to suddenly think they look so small from a distance. But they're basically like me on the inside. <laughs> so essentially, it was that sense of 
I am in your world as you are in mine. And it was about sort of recognizing the very huge difference between an objective perception of, of the other, yeah, and a subjective perception and how to bring them together as a combination of discernment, yeah, and bring, well, just that. And it was, again, that, that was very important to me and was right at the back, I think, ultimately, of becoming re-aware of natural inclusion as a sort of culmination to a struggle um, with um, the scientific, with scientific objectivity. And indeed that struggle, that's because I was struggling so much, that's probably why, or partly why, I found paintings a tremendous respite. Uh, it sort of was a different, it, it was another aspect of myself, yeah? which I was able to bring into expression. Uh, and all of my paintings, ultimately, I realized, you know, from 1969 onwards, were about natural inclusion, all of them. And that's about 100 major ones. Well, thank you very much for sharing, Alan. So um, uh, I, I may have some questions later, but um, who would like to, to, to start the conversation? Anyone would like to engage with Alan? Um, well, while we get someone um, uh, talking, I, I, I will ask you just a very broad question. Um, how, when you when when you start making this shift in the paradigm and developing your idea of natural inclusion, how much how much the existing ideas about complexity um, influence you, or how much you feel that you had um, a, a relationship between complexity and natural inclusion? Yeah, that's that's very interesting because. Um, what had happened to me was that uh, as, 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 I was, as I was getting towards the end of my <laughs> sort of ostensibly scientific life, um, someone said they read this book, but um, here it is. Degree, I, I, I wrote this book called Degrees of Freedom, and it's called Living in Dynamic Boundaries. And what had motivated me to write about living in dynamic boundaries was becoming aware of uh, nonlinear or dynamical systems theory, chaos theory, complexity theory. I became aware uh, of those kinds of ideas and I was really pleased because they started to make a kind of sense to me that I couldn't make sense of reality in, a, in other ways. Uh, and moreover, I could understand them. <laughs> Whereas I'd had tremendous difficulty understanding sort of conventional mathematics. Uh, you know, as, as soon as I sort of saw how we could understand the logistic equation, the discrete logistic equation, almost in terms of what happens when you try to blow up a balloon with holes in it? <laughs> that was the metaphor I had, is you're blowing up a balloon with holes in it. And so, so you'll, either get to a, you, you'll either get to a stable point or you get into an oscillation, or you'll ultimately get into something chaotic, which enabled me almost immediately to sort of understand fixed point, um, limit cycle and strange attractors and all that, attracted and, and then of course fractal geometry attracted me and I was very very attracted by those ideas and I included them uh, in writing that book um, but of course I was no mathematician and uh, as such um, and there was something that bothered me even so that didn't that doesn't go for, they didn't go far enough they were still in some sense, you know, trapped within box logic, trapped within 
a pre-imposed definition, you know, even to the point of defining initial conditions, saying, saying, well, you, you know, you can define if you, 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 you chaos is actually deterministic, um, and it, you know, it arises because you know of feedback, yeah, in 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 a trapped in in a within a defined in within a defined system and. And so, and so I, I just began to recognize there wasn't, there was something, something there, which, so it was well on the way I felt to what was needed towards a much more realistic way of viewing natural organization, but it lacked something. It lacked, I can, in fact, I can say this, it lacked, and, and having read more about complexity theory in recent times, it lacked, um, it lacked an internal orchestrator. It lacked, it lacked, it lacked that presence, that in, it lacked internal agency, that not, not as an executive agency, but as a receptive agency. And this is the switch. And this is also the switch in terms of thinking about leadership, not as something, not as command and, and control, but receptive responsiveness and that has to do also with governance the the center being receptive to inputs yeah and respond receptive and responsive to inputs uh, essentially as a catalyst or like in, in 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 the mode of a catalyst rather than uh as you know an intern an internal controller um so you know, I, deep, I started to develop a somewhat different sense of, of, of what complexity was really all, all about, and um, dissipative systems, all those kinds of ideas. But essentially, as soon as my feeling was that as soon as you put that internal receptivity into the system, then everything falls into place time. Without it, everything is really difficult to orchestrate. So it's again, it has to do with issues, ideas to do with self-organization, but now self-organization from within. Yeah, not, not in terms of things interacting to get together from without. It's kind of very difficult to explain, but I perhaps you get an intuition for what I'm saying? Yeah, definitely. Definitely, I think that is um, fascinating. Um, let's 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 listen to Javier, who is being waiting with a question. Javier, no, just a comment, Angela. Uh, it seems to me that uh, at the very beginning, um, Alan was describing uh, the same idea of Stafford about the porous border of the viable system. Remember that the environment that uh, makes the viable system has a porous border in the sense that people come in and out, like suppliers come in and out, the stockholders come in and out, uh, the buyers or customers come in and out of the system. So I think that the viable system model has anticipated this need of inclusiveness. Okay, but obviously, if you want to be a supplier, you must meet certain standards, certain demands. Uh, and if you want to be a citizen, to me, this is very important because I question the viability of admitting large portions of foreigners into a country with certain standards, certain ways of behaving, certain um, values, and then you're important people that do not hold these values and, and it's not very easy. It, it, we are in a fix right now because in, on one side, you have a lot of private injustices, personal injustices, but in the overall, what happens to a system that is allowing everybody to come into its borders if they don't have the right, let's say software, there's gonna be a shock. So how, we, how do we, deal with the inclusiveness when we know we should be inclusive from a moral standpoint but then it it 
it doesn't work in the practical sense. How do we disseminate these uh, thoughts, these feelings, these uh, pain of yours to, because there are no rights without obligations, okay? So the, the, the migration right now is a very, very important topic worldwide. And we need solutions, okay? I'm just posing the problem. I'm not sort of taking sides. I'm just saying there is a problem, okay? I've noticed that when a Mexican comes to the United States, we're sharing the same religion, we're sharing the same values, and most of the people that go to the United States will share the the ideas about what type of system they're coming in and what type of opportunities they, they get. But this doesn't happen in, in all of the other, in many other instances of, of uh, people, the countries letting people in that do not share the same values that create a system. So to what extent can a system uh, take, to, to what can it take all these different uh, extraneous ways of thinking and still preserve your identity. That, that, that would be my, my trying to uh, insert my thoughts into your uh, natural inclusiveness. Because I think we have to, to go to the practical, to, to the everyday problems if not theory, it's just theory. No, I, I don't like that. I, it would be applicable. Okay, that would be my, my comment. Yes. So what are your ideas on, on this? Yeah. Well, thank you very much. Um, first of all, yes, indeed, you know, when I, one of the major things when I wrote my first of these sort of series of three books was that boundaries are permeable. But they're their permeability varies depending on situation. And that was the purpose of my, 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 my slides. So you show about life cycles, about opening boundaries up, sealing boundaries. So boundaries are dynamical. They're not just permeable, but they're dynamical. And their permeability can be changed and is changed, indeed is changed in all biological systems, change their their boundary permeability in response to their situational circumstances. Uh, and ultimately, one of the ways they do that is that I worked out a long time ago is in relation to redox potential, uh, oxidative redox, you know, essentially about available energy in the outside. So that's, um, you know, and, and that's actually really important because it's actually what makes living systems sustainable is their ability, yeah, to change their boundary permeability in direct relation to the circumstances in which they find themselves and to actually understand how that occurs and how it can occur. And this is quite important, I think, from, from these, these angles that you described. I mean, it's, it's not about open to all it's about varying varying your permeability in dynamically in relation uh to circumstances and that i think is it's an important it's very important thing to understand another thing that's important to understand is that a great you know a great number of our current human difficulties between cultures is is as as you described is actually having opposed points of view, which, which don't actually appreciate the significance of the other. So essentially that we get, get into these us and them types of confrontations where, you know, those within, you know, a particular culture will, will feel, well, this is how the world works. Uh, and those in another culture will feel, well, no, it doesn't, it works the other way. But actually to understand these apparent oppositions as complementarities makes a huge difference. And that is possible, I think. Uh, that's quite possible for us to find ways 
uh, in which to do that, to achieve that. And, and it is to do, but it is to do with recognizing, you know, there's something that has to shift <laughs> in the way we have been mostly framing reality um, and, and getting caught in this sort of conflict between collectivism and individualism. Um, and, you know, and, and the idea of actually natural inclusion values both the individual and the group and doesn't see them as being in, in conflict. And that's really important. Uh, so if we can begin to um, develop that wider understanding, socially, politically, scientifically, whatever, then I think it can help the kinds of difficulty that you've outlined. And it's, I'm, I'm speaking quite spontaneously, <laughs> so, but I, I have written about these things as well. Um, and so, you know, I, th I, think, I think the natural inclusion does offer a way, but it's not about open to all. It's not about that at all. Uh, and it's certainly not open to closure. <laughs> if you see what I mean, it's not open to closed minded thinking. Um, thank you, Alan. We have another question from Louis. You are muted, Louis. Um, more just wanting to add, add to what Alan was saying, because one of the things that I was reflecting on in relation to this whole dynamic between, um, you know, when, when people are flooding away from their homes, and there was, um, and so I'll, I'll kind of, to say to Alan, just fine tune anything I say, because obviously I'm not um, the world's founder of natural inclusion, but it's something that has been profoundly informing what I've been doing over the years that I came across it. And one of the things um, I remember reading from Alan is he talks about this notion of natural needfulness. And I was really uh, fascinated by that because of this notion of um, you know, hearing words about neediness and greediness and then understanding nature's natural flow. And of course, what natural flow is, is flowing from full to empty, from fullness into space. That's where water flows air in our lungs. We don't have the air outside saying, oh, I must rush in there. Our lungs open up and flows in. And in contemplating the notion of greediness, if you think of that in terms of full and empty, what you've actually got is people who are so full and yet they are still trying to drag more in. So think about that in terms of capitalism and what's happening in, in the world and in terms of resources. And then thinking, so that's a violation of naturals, of nature's natural flow. And then the other part is what about people who are fleeing from one place to another? And when I was first thinking about this, it was more to do with um, people from Syria. Now, of course, we have Ukraine and, and other countless places where people who have nothing, where there is immense emptiness in the capacities of their homelands to support them and what you know so me imagining being in that place and thinking what would have me move so from empty to something that I'm believing is full so I think about a western nation I think about the UK or the US and say well they've got so much and so I and the and so that but that again is a violation of nat nature's natural flow because it's going from empty. You know, the only thing I may have is me flowing to a place that's already full. And so um, to me, there's a sense of, oh, and until we recover our, our, our own engagement with what is natural needfulness, and that dynamic between, well, I'm full and what, you know, what can flow out? And that flowing out, going to places where there is receptivity, where there is nothing there. And holding that as a, as a real kind of litmus to 
me and my engagement and that receptive responsivity um, and natural needfulness. And I think until more of us start really attuning to that, we can't really challenge um, the way that capitalism plays out because it's that there is a complete violation of nature's natural way. And I think it speaks to the um, that slide you had, Alan, of the de degenerative and regenerative. We need both. Yes. We need to die so that new life can become. And so this, this kind of um, drivenness to um, preserve life, again, you know, there's a way in which we take that to an extreme, which becomes a violation of nature's natural way. And us as human beings, I think this maybe this is partly speaking to what you were saying, Alan, as well about, um, you know, our kind of uh, attachment to mechanism and, and objectivism. And added to this is this way in which we get deeply attached to um, this sense of omnipotence, you know, that we are God, we are nature, we can save you know, fix, um, achieve things. And some of that is a violation to nature's way because almost everything we're doing is causing, you know, you know, are, are causal factors in the situation we find ourselves in because we're working against nature's natural way. Um, so anyway, that's... No, well, thank you for saying that, Louis. I mean, uh, essentially, yes, I'd, I, I've often toyed with the idea of re write, rewriting a book called The Needful Gene instead of The Selfish Gene, because essentially it's that very idea of the selfish gene, you know, that, 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 that as the gene being selfish, <laughs> that, that's right at the heart of, uh, uh, of neo-Darwinism, and that is taught unremittingly in <laughs> to new generation after generation now and I actually thought well you know actually when we understand that most fundamentally we are needful creatures and we know what, what needfulness feels like it feels like hunger <laughs> and a lot of what we do has to do with that sense of of, of, of an internal hunger, yeah, which need, if we're to actually live, is actually we're going to need uh, an input of energy in order to do so. So it's a very, you know, it's that sort of splitting of the, of the self from the other that, that creates this idea and has to do, as you say, with the human fear, especially of mortality uh, and, and of seeing death as an end uh as distinct from what it actually is naturally in 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 in, in nature it's actually uh, it has a, it plays a huge variety of distinctive roles in natural processes uh of release of protection of all sorts of things i've i've written about that as well um but of course you know we have this human fear and that almost is it, it, that that is what sort of leads us to try to try to essentially box ourselves in, yeah, within an, within a, within in, within an impermeable boundary, and then we get all that kinds of associated behaviour that you described. Yes, so yes, needfulness. Yeah, think about needfulness, and that's not the same as neediness. It is it is straightforwardly how we are as biological organisms. Needful. You are not selfish, but needful. And thank you. Um, Hans Peter. Hans Peter has a question. Yeah, well, you know, I, I need to say something before I ask the question. And uh, first of all, I, I really enjoyed the presentation uh, and the thoughts you you uh, brought in here. You know, you you refer to your what you did as a very early child, and what I realize now is that when I was young, I was born with the an ability to develop roots. I never had a home. I, I wasn't at home in the village I grew up. I wasn't at home in the family I grew up. 
I left my social class, I left my country, I lived in different countries. And what I realized is that we all have a very unique life experience. Um, and it's, it's, it's our life experience. Nobody else can experience what I experience. And when I came in new countries, I was always very suspicious about people claiming these are our values. Who is our? And that refers to what uh, Javier said a little bit earlier. You know, who defines what the, the values are in a country? And these values are evolving. So this question, um, you know, for example, I do not share most of my, the, my values with the people in the country I live in right now, the United States. Uh, there is no value set that the majority actually shares. Even when you go into what is the current majority, it seems to be the majorities, there are people with different values. So for me, it is, it is you know, uh, it seems to be very important that we can only experience or get close to experience what other people experience by listening. Would you agree that this listening to other people is the main way how we actually can experience or get out of our own self inner and, and get an idea of what other people might actually experience in their way of life? I, I sometimes use you know, the example that some people are very happy when a dog is sitting close to them and they have, get very nice feelings from the dog. I always get very negative feelings when I'm close to a dog because we just don't get along with each other. But this, you know, is, is... so going back to this question, should we be open to migration? And listening to migration? And accepting that our values are not absolutely defined, they evolve over time and, you know, we, we have caused migration, so maybe we need to accept migration and not use our, our values, which are not well defined, as a defense for others not coming in. But what, what are your thoughts on that? Well, a lot, a lot of things, yes. I mean, first of all, listening is absolutely crucial. And that's why I speak of receptivity. Receptivity is essentially listening uh, and it's crucial to empathy and empathy is the ability to envisage how it feels to be in the place of the other just that yeah. and in order to be able to envisage how it feels to be in the place of the other which is essentially the approach that I've always took to biology to understanding organisms was I imagined myself within their skin not as a human being not anthropomorphically like David Attenborough does but but in the sense of okay supposing i had this 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 shape and form and this circumstance how would i feel and how would i be relating to the world in which i find myself and listening is crucial to that but the but listening with more than listening but responding uh, as well um you know because you, i i hear a lot of people talk about you know how important it is to listen but actually there's also this question of responding yep. which, which, is, which, is, which is huge that's why it's receptive responsiveness to form a relationship that's what relationships are about um so yeah um <laughs> you might have noticed that one of my slides was as a swallow <laughs> flying from south africa to england <laughs> yes which is a painting which i called i'm migration and it actually related to my own personal experience, which is not dissimilar to yours, of being uprooted uh, from Africa and suddenly finding myself in an English culture. And I went to school and I didn't understand what they were talking about because they, had, they didn't have decimal currency, for example. And I, I found, I can't work, that, work things out in shillings and pence. Don't do it. I can't. I can't. I don't understand what a farthing is. What the hell is a farthing? Because those were the days. It tells, it tells you how old I was. So, yeah, I mean, this is this is re really significant. And it is this appreciation of our individual uniqueness as well as our inclusion within the larger community and actually understanding that that's what community life is truly about it's not about all conforming to one or other kind of view it's it's actually about 
it is actually vital if you imagine you know think of our own body if if is is is, a, is is you know if we didn't have gut cells and brain cells you know you know they're very different yeah. <laughs> and that's how, that's how we work <laughs> as an organism is by actually having difference you know so difference is absolutely vital uh to community life and that's why i talk i never talk about diversity unity and diversity i talk about diversity in community and you know that's actually for, for me sort of unity and diversity is actually a paradox diversity in community isn't and and it's about recepting the accepting the uniqueness of the individual experience you know, within the context, you know, we've not, none of us have had the same experience, you know, because we can't. Um, so that's, that's your very important point. Thank you. I, have I, have I asked, answered reasonably okay? Yep. Thank you. Thank you for raising those points. Thank you, that's and Anne Ellen. Um, we have Brian. Uh, yes. Uh, I'm going to hold a book up here. Can you see the book? Not yet. No, no. I can't see the. I can see the book, but not the writing. Uh, on it. I'll read out the title: Lifespan, Why We Age and Why We Don't Have. To. Is that throwing a spanner in the work? Why we age, and why we don't have to, and why we don't have to. It's a very interesting thing. It, it reflects a human desire, doesn't it? And, and um, I, it's it's certainly to me, yeah, it does throw a spanner in the works. I think it's 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 it, that that kind of uh, aspiration. I mean, we're, it's always looking for immortality, always always looking for not aging, or even treating aging as a, as a, as you know as a disease. So. That's right. Um, uh, it's and that, I think, yeah, and I think uh, that, yeah, I mean, one of the ways I, I sort of sometimes try to put it in terms of, you know, that life is not a struggle for existence, which essentially, and as, as a culmination of that struggle, you essentially become immortal by entirely, <laughs> entirely preventing yourself from change, yeah, entirely sealing yourself in. But like, if you understand life as a gift of natural energy flow, which we receive, nurture, and pass on, as uh, you know, as as circumstances change, that to me is much more within uh, naturally the natural ecology of how life works, uh, and it is this continuing effort to stave off what we don't desire in various ways uh, that can actually ultimately get us into really deep trouble uh, and conflict uh, and well actually what kind of life would it be <laughs> not to be able to get excited <laughs> or, or, or not to be able to love or any of those things which are actually right at the heart of, 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 of natural needfulness. So I think, yeah, it's an interesting book that book title, and it's one that would uh, would cause me to read with a certain critical vision. <laughs> Can I <laughs> sugar the yeah. pill a little bit? Yeah. Um, the guy who wrote the book is David Sinclair. Uh, he's a biologist and a researcher at Harvard Medical School. And the main theory that he's keen on is by C.H. Waddington. Oh, yes. The strategy of the genes, which Stafford Beer was also keen on. It's in Brain of the Firm. It's the notion of an epigenetic landscape. Yes, I mean, I, I have great admiration for Waddington. Um, I think he was well on the way. <laughs> I think he was well on the way to natural inclusion. Um, and um, what else? What else do, do I say? Um, uh, I'm just trying to 
trying to get back because a thought crossed my mind and now it's gone again. So you were sort of talking about Waddington. Oh yes, the epigenetic landscape. Yeah, well, um, it's it's. I actually once wrote a paper called Hyperepigenetics, uh, which was actually yet a further stage removed and looking at the relation. Uh, you know, epigenetics is all about the uh, control of gene expression within yes. the organism, uh, whereas hyperepigenetics is actually about boundary dynamics. It's about the interface between the, the between the living system boundary yeah and and the outside world and i got very interested in this relate in at one point in my life in relation to these very issues to do with boundary sealing and boundary opening and boundary impermeability and boundary permeability and how the, and, and the extraordinary role that oxygen in terrestrial systems has in that uh in that you know in in many ways uh you know, oxygen, the generation of oxygen via photosynthesis intoxicated the atmosphere and the ability to live a terrestrial life essentially revolves around the ability to, to protect from overdosing on oxygen, because if you overdose, you suffer from oxidative stress. And one of the things that I was very interested in was actually how redox potential affects boundary per permeability and in fact, uh, that has to do with free radical chemistry as well, which is uh, <laughs> which is very very independent of, of genetic control. Uh, so, yeah, I mean it's an interesting point. And that is is that we need not only to understand the internal regulation of gene expression, but we also under, need to understand the external. Yeah, the relationship between the external and yeah and the boundary. Uh, in terms of regulating regulating um, <clears throat> boundary permeability. Essentially, you know, free radical chemistry leads to thing formation, you know, it leads to melanization, hardening, keratinization, all these sorts of things, yeah, which are essentially making a, an impermeable boundary, which protects the interior, yeah, from, from loss. So, Again, we get back to that important question of the relationship, yeah, between boundary openness, which of course also means boundary means vulnerability and boundary impermeability, and there's there's quite a lot more that I could expand upon there, mm. um, but I think I suspect the author is taking a partial view of reality of, of living reality. <laughs> Right. Okay, thank you, Alan and Brian. We have um, Marta. Marta has a question. You are muted, Marta. You are muted. Thank you, Angela, and thank you, Alan, for this uh, conversation. I, I really enjoyed it very much. Uh, it's difficult for me to express in English. I'm Colombian. I'm a very good friend of Angela and John. And um, and I've been moving here in Colombia uh, from five years ago after a long experience uh, in my life with um, with nature and also with um, um, technology, uh, digital uh, things. I'm a systems engineer, and now I've said I really thought that. Uh, feeling about uh, how the, our life is getting out of, 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 I mean, it's disappearing from Earth. Uh, that's what the, uh, all the corporations and the governments and every, uh, everybody were with, to whom we have delegated. Uh, the, the main things of our lives, they, they are almost, uh, I mean, the owners of all our decisions in the grassroots. So my, my uh, I prop I'm proposing a, a, a something that I've called Minganet, which is a network of Mingas, and Mingas uh, is an, an indigenous word for getting solidarity and working together, and 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 really getting being connected with nature. So I that's why I feel so much connected with your talk, and um, and this initiative is is really looking for 
these networks that are already doing something about this, which is taking care of nature and taking care of, of themselves and, and all these things. And, and, and there are a lot of efforts everywhere about that, but they are all disconnected and they are fragmented. So I'm trying to say, okay, let's use uh, these technologies to get us all together to bring these uh, experiences that we're doing and, 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 uh, and for moving this in, uh, collective intelligence among us to, 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 to do something about that and to, and to get to have some incidents on the policies or whatever, not, not, not really getting down uh, trying to push or to, to, to fight against, the, against these capitalisms and all these things, but really doing proposals and, and, and working together. So that's how we're moving. And uh, but uh, th the real thing is that we would like also to to help people to work together because this is not about individuals, but because we are independent, we have to really get to work together and, and move this together. So this Mingas is 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 what we're really trying to to push and make this Minga net also a big Minga, where the we're taking. Care of life is taking care of ourselves, which are the, the initiators of whatever, and then uh, and then how to how to work together, uh, starting from there. So uh, I would like to ask if you because that's that's our central point because we have a chip that is already um, married with uh, very bad uh, costumes of. Uh, the person that talks in the groups or is the person that knows more and the egos and all these things. So we have to really get to have some clues on, on how to work together and also and, and have a, like an organization, as you said, a self-organization from within, like a mycelium. How can humanity get organized like a mycelium where there's no really hierarchies, but really working this way? And and but that's the real difficult uh, thing to do: how to get organized in order to 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 bring this out. So I don't know if you have worked on that and have some clues on that and 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 and, and talk about that. Well, well, I've certainly thought about it a lot. And you know, one of the things that is so frustrating is that there are so many people who are actually in one way or another, very, very close in their understanding of, of nature and of reality. And yet they're disparate, we're, we're disparate, you know, that we're sort of scattered. Um, and as yet, we haven't, I don't think, and this is why I talk about natural inclusion, we haven't actually found a, um, an, an over or underarching, <laughs> an underarching philo natural philosophy, which brings helps to bring all these different uh, viewpoints into confluence. And in a way, that's it's it's about looking for this orchestrate. It's a, it's an orchestrating internal influence, like the conductor of an orchestra. Yeah, it's it's not about all you know con mm. about co controlling everyone, but it's a way of drawing people with valid but different viewpoints together into a common understanding of how of how the world works. And essentially, you know, I'm there to say that's what I think natural inclusion is 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 and it's it's a move. It's a it's an evolutionary understanding which is way beyond uh, Darwinian selection. It's way beyond that, and it's not either it's not either cooperation or competition. It's not that. It actually goes deeper than that. It's 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 about how we bring the communities together, as in you know, and, and respect both the individual variation and what's in common. Um, so that's very much, you know, what I, why I've been spending the last 20 years trying to help people become aware of natural inclusion. Um, and it's been very, very difficult because of all the, diff all the I've encountered huge resistances, including 
from those who I would think, you know, would be closest to it. Uh, you know, so there are, you know, there are people who I have great admiration for who I've tried to make contact with or have a conversation with and they cut it out. And there is, and you know, so, so somehow there are so many people and I would think this very much applies to those working within systems, th systems thinking and complexity theory. Uh, yeah, we all know there's something wrong. <laughs> but it's the question of how can we recognize, on the one hand, what really is wrong? Mm -hmm. uh, and how can we work, as you described, work together uh, to bring about transformational change? Um, now, that is why, essentially, you know, I've been, and it's been a lonely road, a very lonely road, it still is. Um, of trying to bring an understanding of natural inclusion to a wider audience. And it's been very, very difficult because essentially I find I have to battle both with reductionism and with holism. Both of them, to my mind, to my thinking, are actually essentially um, partial views of reality and it's natural inclusion that can bring them into correspondence into mutual correspondence through as I put it the receptive simplicity in the heart of complexity that essentially the gravitational influence within the energetic and circulation so mm -hmm. yeah but it's very difficult because somehow you've got to get these people get people together and and, and truly listening to one another and not arguing for their particular standpoint of view. And, you know, with, I think there's a lot of habits that we've all got as human beings, including me, of course, mm -hmm. uh, where we position ourselves and defend our case. <laughs> and, and that has to go somehow. We have to let those barriers disintegrate. Yeah, to unlearn. Yes, indeed. To unlearn, yeah. Indeed, yes. Yeah, just to let you know, we, we are moving this idea because it's been very hard from the grassroots to work with these ideas uh, because the networks are not really a transversal networks. There are still hierarchical networks and yeah. all these things. So so I've, I'm looking for uh, networks that are looking things like this and we'll have a uh, World Social Forum the May 4th were uh, proposing to have some Latin American, the, these big name, like a global tapestry of alternatives there are from India. And, uh, and there's some other people, for example, my first job, which is working for really uh, using technologies for the good uh, and, and, and for these issues. So we're going to have a uh, together to thinking on a Latin American space for promoting something like this yeah. for to life care. So that'll be May 4 if you ever want to join. It's gonna be, we'll have translation and um, I'll send Angela the yeah. information if any one of you can yeah. would like to join. And thank you so much, Alan, for- Okay, for thank you very much. Right, well, thank you very much, Martha and, and Alan. Mm, seems to be that we are coming to the end of this session. I don't know if anyone has a final question or nearly. Right. So, um, well, in that case, I think that thank you, Madeline, Alan. Really exciting and um, really an open an open field that I am sure that so, some of us would like to revisit again. Uh, very important for us as cyberneticians because uh, Stafford Beer's uh, uh, theory, as you know, is the theory of organizational viability. And he started from very similar principles than you, that basically no, no organization is viable on its own. Viability is a, is, is a relational characteristic. Yeah. You cannot be viable on your own because you will need from others to uh, survive from. So yeah. that's really interesting the way that, I mean, for me, the, the big lesson is that 
even all the, the attempts to progress towards a more holistic understanding of organizations uh, are still very limited because they still don't consider completely the idea of correspondence and the idea and also uh, the, the dichotomy between science and spirituality, between science and the arts, between our ways of thinking and, and, and talking about reality, about social reality, and our, and our, and our ways of experiencing our emotions and, uh, and, uh, and, and our needs, uh, as you say, are just one. Uh, they are all completely related. So we still need to bridge a big gap to, yeah. to much more um, deep and uh, and spiritual because i mean this is the 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 by the end this all also about the spirituality isn't it so it is yes and it's about bringing the science the art and the spirituality together yes i mean i obviously i'm very you know i'm very happy for people to approach me by email so if they if they do you don't know my email address but you can get to it via <laughs> via angela i guess Yes, absolutely. Um, and I'm very happy to share, you know, publications, whatever with you, if, or to enter into conversation with you about anything that I've been speaking about today. Um, yeah, so it's, you know, I want it to be accessible to the wider world and not just locked in my head and in my study. <laughs> so, yeah, thank you very much for having me and uh, and for such a such a fine conversation following upon the talk. Thank you so much. Thank you, Elena. Thank you for coming. And see you next time. Next time is uh, Jose Perez Rios, and it's going to be on the 4th of May. So see you again in a couple of weeks. Okay. Thank right. you very much. Thank you. Thank you. See you.